Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our presentation tonight about the Huntington Sesquicentennial Exhibition and the Huntington Museum of Art's new book, Eclectic Rhythms, The Artists of Huntington, West Virginia, 1871 to the Present. So tonight's presentation is going to be first about the exhibition, where we're going to talk a little bit about the different uh, works in the show, sampling at least, and then we're going to go to talk on about Eclectic Rhythms, the book that accompanies the, uh, the new show here. So I hope you enjoy it. Sort of in starting out on this discussion, uh, we have to think about our founder, Collis P. Huntington, and this is a bust by Anna Hyatt Huntington, uh, the wife of Collis's adopted son, which is in our collection. And Collis P. Huntington was known as the great persuader. He was a railroad tycoon, and he put together with his allies a number of rail lines, uh, including the Central Pacific Railroad and the Union Pacific Railway that were joined together in 1869 at Promontory Point, Utah. And he is the man who came here and settled our town uh, as a point of access for his railroad. And we owe the name of the city and its founding to him. So it's an exciting piece to have in this exhibition. You know, it's rare that a, a location actually has a painting this early uh, that depicts what it looked like at its beginning. But here we have one of Huntington done in 1874 by an anonymous artist. And it really sh shows an amazing landscape from across the Ohio River looking to West Virginia. We have the river boats on the river. And in the front sort of right area there, we have along the river, the Ensign Foundry. Um, and then if we look off into the distance in the background on the left, we actually have the CNO Railway Yards. And if we look carefully, we can see two railroads, one running in the background, just to the right uh, of the yards. You can see the little steam coming out of it and smoke coming out of its chimney. And there's another railroad coming down to the Ensign Car Works uh, to reach that. And what's really interesting is you look over to the right there by the bushes on the hill, you'll see almost what looks like a steeple and a little building. And that's Marshall Academy, later to become Marshall College and Marshall University. And Marshall University is a way many, many artists came to, uh, to Huntington in the day. And among those was Arthur S. Carpenter, who was born in Gore, Virginia, attended Shepherd University, and then the Pennsylvania State University. And he served as the chair of Marshall's art department from 1952 to 1974. And this is his work from our collection entitled The Construction Workers, which dates to the 1950s. And it shows two men reaching up with giant wrenches to work on some sort of building or machine. Another one of the people who came to teach at Marshall was Marion Best Fours, who was born in Knoxville, Tennessee, attended the University of Tennessee, the Yale School of Fine Arts, uh, where she studied oil, watercolor, and tempera and fresco mural painting and the Art Academy of Cincinnati. She was an instructor at Marshall in the 1930s and is known for her mural in the Morrow Library there, which depicts figures representing Marshall University, West Virginia literature, and American literature. And this scene here is actually the CNO Depot downtown, which is now the, uh, the CVB and home of the Mata Bakery. Uh, in an unfortunate twist, both she and her husband were both uh, employed by Marshall University in the 30s. And uh, a new law or rule came into effect that forced uh, spouses uh, to vacate positions at Marshall because they didn't allow husbands and wives to both work for the university. So uh, sort of a tragic thing. She would go on to move uh, out of Huntington uh, and work elsewhere in the country before her death in 1989. And there were also big businesses that brought artists to Huntington, among them D.E. Abbott, who we'll talk about later, and the Standard Printing Company. Standard Printing Company in Huntington was owned by Herman Dean, who was a founder of the Huntington Museum of Art and a noted a collector of American and European firearms. And he brought Chuck Ripper here in 1953 to head up his art department uh, at his business. And Chuck was born in Pennsylvania and studied at the Art Institute of Pittsburgh. And after coming here in 1953, he worked for Standard Printing for a long time, but eventually became known for a lot of his illustration work that he did for companies like L.L. Bean, uh, Peterson's Field Guide for animals and birds, as well as for his U.S. postage stamps, uh, which were completed in 1980 and 1987, 
and were among those popular issues of those years. And we believe this painting by Ripper is probably an L.L. Bean catalog, but we haven't confirmed that yet. In terms of subjects in the uh, sesquicentennial exhibition, one of the ones that pops up uh, both there and in the collection in general relating to West Virginia uh, is that of extraction. And here we have a painting uh, entitled Rock Forms by Ruth Etling. Uh, Etling was born in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania and studied at the Rhode Island School of Design and later at Marshall Universities. And for many years, she was an instructor at Putnam Junior High School located in Ashland, Kentucky. But she was known throughout the country for her print work. But it, here we have a painting depicting, you know, the stratigraphy, st stratigraphy of, uh, you know, West Virginia. And it's something that uh, shows up again and again in the uh, collection. And we're talking about extraction. We can also look at this work uh, titled Union Sand and Gravel by Olga Thabit. Thabit was born in the Ottoman Empire and emigrated first to the Syrian colony in Brooklyn, New York and trained at the Art Students League, where she was a commercial artist before coming to Huntington in the early 1920s. And she was known for helping to run the Federal Arts Project uh, group, the Depression Era uh, Huntington Art Center Association, uh, which showed works during that era, and was influential in pushing for the establishment of an art museum in Huntington. Final work in this group is this really wonderful painting by R. Campbell Neal called The, Quift, the Cliff Dwellers. Uh, Neal was born in Huntington and attended Marshall University, where he studied under Joseph Jablonski and under Marion Vesfors and Alice Kershaw. He was actually a commercial artist who ran the Neal Campbell Company, which specialized in the design and manufacture of commercial neon signs in Huntington. But this is sort of a really fun work showing the different levels that have been sort of dug away in the search for uh, almost certainly coal um, here in West Virginia. As we get into the 1950s and 60s, we, we get to see more and more abstraction coming into uh, the, the work of artists in Huntington. And this is a work by Annette Poland, uh, who was born in Huntington and studied extensively at Hollis University, Hollins University in Roanoke, Virginia, and then at the Col de Louvre in Paris, France, and at the Tyler School of Art in Philadelphia. And she's best known as, the law, as a longtime professor at the Co Co Corcoran College of Art and Design in Washington, DC. Um, and her artwork has been exhibited around the world and it's a, a great pleasure to have this print in our collection, which is an untitled work. An abstraction went right into sculpture here as well. This is by Jim Collins. It's called Red, circa 1965. Collins was born in Huntington and attended Marshall University, then the Univers University of Michigan, uh, and uh, also studied at uh, the Ohio University in Athens, Ohio, where he received an MFA in sculpture. And from the 1960s to the 1980s, he was a professor of art at the University of Tennessee of Chattanooga. And his um, sculptural metal, work, metal works have been shown all over the American South. We also see that abstraction in glassmaking here in West Virginia. Of course, West Virginia is known for glassmaking. And this is Wayne Houston's vase number 597. Uh, Houston succeeded the venerable Winslow Anderson as the in-house designer at the Blanco Glass Company in Milton, West Virginia. Uh, and over the next decade that he was there from about 1952 to 63, he created over 600 designs for the company that were known for their sculptural quality and architectural scale. And this is really a wonderful piece uh, from the museum's collection. Uh, he was joined by the Moretti brothers at uh, the competing firm of Pilgrim here in the Huntington area. Alessandro Moretti, whose work on the left uh, titled Marine Life, and Roberto Moretti, whose work on the right is entitled Seated Figure, uh, were both born in Italy. Alessandro trained uh, at the Seguso factory, uh, where, uh, which was known for its artistic glass. He arrived to work for Pilgrim in 1956, and his brother Mar Roberto uh, arrived in 1958 to join him, and they were uh, well-respected and well-known glassmakers for uh, decades here in West Virginia. But there's also more traditional forms of glass, uh, and this is actually uh, a work by Kelsey Murphy, who worked at Pilgrim many years after the Moretti's. And while there, she helped develop and sort of bring back to life the creation of cameo glass. And cameo glass is the layering of different colors of glass, one over the other, over which a design is laid, and then the glass is slowly cut away to reveal uh, the imagery. And you have to be very careful doing this because it's very easy to forget which layer you're in as you're carving it away. 
this vase, which depicts um, scenery in Huntington, including what we see here is the tower of the Cabell County Courthouse, is actually a six layer uh, vase, but Kelsey's worked on ones going all the way up to 10 layers. And what we have to know about this type of glass work is the chemistry is so hard to deal with and get correct is that many of these works self-destruct before they're even finished. In fact, the loss rate is 75%, which is pretty amazing. Uh, we're very happy to have a lot of uh, the cameo work from Pilgrim in the museum's collection. Uh, and there are many artists who uh, followed their own pursuits um, in our region. Um, here we have the work Pigeonholed by Vernon Howell, who was born in Huntington. He attended Syracuse University and Marshall and later studied at George Washington University and the National Gallery of Art in Washington, DC. He was a longtime high school teacher at Barbersville High School and is known for his carvings and graphic works. And this is just a wonderful uh, graphic work showing all the little cubicles filled with lots of different imagery and objects. One of the great painters to uh, come out of Huntington was June Kilgore. This is her work, Inner Pyramid, from the 1970s. She attended Marshall University and then studied at George Peabody College uh, and then Ohio University. And uh, following the retirement of Arthur Carpenter, who we talked about earlier, she actually was named the chair of the art department at Marshall, uh, where she served until 1989. And it was during her tenure that the Burke Art Gallery was developed, uh, as was the creation of the graphic design major at Marshall. And uh, she was one of the best painters ever to work in Huntington. And according to the West Virginia Encyclopedia, is known as one of the most influential West Virginia artists of the 20th century. And right alongside her uh, would be Stan Sporney, probably the next best painter uh, ever to work in Huntington. Uh, this is his painting, the Scioto River, Ohio Bridges. Uh, he was born in Philadelphia, attended the Philadelphia College of Art and the University of Pennsylvania where he studied under a number of American luminaries, including James Brooks, Paul George, Red Grooms, Alex Catt, Alice Neal, Larry Poons, and Neil Welliver. Um, he got a federal grant to create a series of paintings for the Veterans Hospital in Huntington, and also was the person selected to do a, a, a cycle of murals on the flood wall in Huntington in the 90s, which never happened. Um, he is among the most revered uh, artists uh, to work in Huntington. Uh, and has been greatly missed since his uh, sudden death in 2008. One of the popular artists um, who, who came out of Huntington was Adele Thornton Lewis. Uh, born in Huntington, went to Marshall University to study chemistry, though she never finished her degree because she really wanted to be an artist. And she started that work at the Corps of Engineers and studied with local artists, Arthur Barber, Arthur Carpenter, Marion Vestfors, Joseph Jablonski and others. And she became uh, very well known in the region and is best known for uh, three important portraits that she did. Uh, the portrait of Marshall University basketball coach, Cam Henderson, the official portrait of West Virginia Governor Jay Rockefeller and the portrait of Brigadier General Charles Chuck Yeager uh, for whom the Yeager Scholars Program at Marshall University uh, was created. And this is a painting entitled Fishing Buddies from the 1980s. There were also a number of self-taught artists who uh, worked in the city. Among them was Gerald Creative Dupree. Uh, and this is his uh, drawing, His Majesty's Ship. He was born in Huntington, was a US Navy veteran who suffered from heart problems, which made him seem at times very nervous in his disposition. And uh, he depicted all sorts of different sort of historical scenarios in his drawings and became well, no well known enough to have his work selected for inclusion at the Smithsonian American Art Museum in Washington, DC. Another great self-taught artist is Billy Scott. Billy Scott was an African-American artist from Huntington. He was born here. He's a former police officer and, and the owner and proprietor of a very popular barber shop in Huntington. And his works were initially shown in the uh, Black Art Expo shows where the museum would actually select a group of artists to showcase at the museum. Um, and uh, Billy Scott was one of those people in the 1980s and we're delighted to have this work, which is the Barnett School for Colored Children. And, uh, Scott's works often depict uh, scenes from uh, Huntington's history, and we're lucky to have two works in the collection by him. There's also wonderful sculptors who have worked in Huntington. This is a work um, by Earlene Allen, who was born on Long Island, New York, and moved as a child to Logan, West Virginia. She worked in Charleston before coming to Huntington, where for 40 years she worked at Marshall University as a ceramics professor, and her works have been exhibited all over the state and the region. 
One of my favorites in the collection is this work, The Fencing Teapots with Nubbies by Kathleen Nisi. Kathleen uh, arrived in Huntington as a child and uh, received her BA from Clemson University, attended Marshall University, Miami University located in Oxford, Ohio, and also studied at Lincoln Memorial University in Harrogate, Tennessee, and Georgia State University. Since 2000, she has served as the ceramic artist in residence at HMA. In addition to overseeing the selection, organizing, and uh, studying that goes along with our noted ceramic artists as part of the museum's Walter Gropus Master Artist Program. And Huntington can even call a uh, famous skateboard artist as one of its own. Uh, Don Pendel Pendleton was born in Ripley, West Virginia, but for 15 years lived in Huntington. And he's known primarily for his skateboard designs. This is a print called Mutability in the museum's collection. And he's worked and done design work for all sorts of famous uh, institutions and groups including Gatorade, Logitech, Mountain Dew, uh, and Nike. There's also been a number of important uh, African-American artists, especially African-American women. Uh, this is a work by Elaine Blue called Remission. Uh, Blue was born in Clarksburg, West Virginia and studied in Pasadena, California. Uh, she was an African-American painter, teacher, author, poet, and founder of the Huntington Theatrical Ensemble. Uh, she was a member of the Tri-States Art Association, and um, her paintings were featured in exhibitions as far away as Africa. And among her subjects were images that ranged from joyous and lighthearted to works that highlighted social problems such as abuse, neglected poverty, um, and also uh, her own fight with cancer. And she was the feature of a uh, solo exhibition not long before her death at the Huntington Museum of Art in 2010 and 11. This is a work, uh, textile work called Inspiration Facing East by Teresa Polly Shellcroft, another prominent African-American African female uh, artist. She was born in Huntington, studied at West Virginia State University and also Marshall University. Uh, she also studied African-American art, history and culture at the University of Pittsburgh and for years has taught in California at the Hesperia Unified School District and at Victor Valley College in Victorville, California. Uh, one of her claims to fame is one of her quilts was selected to travel across the country as part of the celebrations around President Barack Obama's inauguration in 2009. And this is uh, uh, another textile work, this one by Tina Williams Brewer. Again, another female African, -Amer African American artist was born in Huntington. She attended the Col Columbus College of Art and Design um, and has remarked on her work that they are they're works that tell a story. They carry messages from ancestors. And I'll quote her here. My work is a celebration of the profound joy of gathering with loved ones and the strength of spiritual connections. It is an expression of the deep pain of racism and the pathways forward, the resilience of African-American families and the light that lifts them up. My intention is to give dignity to human suffering, finding rhythms that are both mind-stirring and soul-soothing. And this work here uh, is entitled Sing For Me, O Goldy Bridge. And it, it's referencing the, 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 the disaster that occurred for the, in the construction of the Goldie Bridge and its accompanying tunnel, where many uh, men were exposed to high levels of, of silicon uh, in the digging and developed silicosis and became very sick and died. Now we wanna talk a little bit about the book that sort of goes along with the show, Eclectic Rhythms. Um, and this is an image of the noted art historian, Chris Petties, to whom the book is dedicated. And she wrote the first groundbreaking biographical dictionary on women artists called Dictionary of Women Artists, an International Dictionary of Women Artists Before 1900. Uh, and we're very delighted to dedicate the book to her and have the support of her family and its creation. And the, what we're gonna talk about in this section is some of the art and artists that are not in the exhibition, but are included in the book. And this book was a over two year project. And what it's created is a biographical dictionary uh, of over six, uh, well not over, but approximately 600 artists that lived in Huntington at some point during their lives. And we know that's not everybody, but it's a beginning place for those interested in, um, in researching artists in Huntington. We hope that as people look at it and read it, they'll start to remember and think about other artists they knew that, that were in Huntington that we can add to a page on our website that's going to get updated very regularly. So let's uh, talk a little bit more about uh, some of the other artists that were here in Huntington. And one of them was Darwin E. Abbott, 
And he, his firm, D. Abbott and Company, was one of the big companies that brought artists to Huntington. Uh, he became a national and international frame manufacturer and also did work in photography. Um, and that's how he started his career as a photographer. But his picture frame company shipped his frames all over the world and all over the country. This uh, image here is a copy of one of the catalogs from his company in the museum collection. Um, and he had salesmen that traveled all across the United States uh, selling his work. And there are many artists who came to work for him for a time and then went off to have careers elsewhere. And there were also artists that came after having successful careers elsewhere to work for him to sort of end their careers. Um, and he was a very big business located at the West End of Huntington. Uh, this is a great work, a view of Rockport, Massachusetts done in 1926 by Joseph Jablonski. Uh, Jablonski uh, was born in Europe, but he came to America and settled in Rochester, New York. He attended Harvard University where he won the Pratt Fellowship for Art Studies in Europe and also came to Marshall University to serve as the second um, uh, director of the uh, art program, succeeding Edwin Myers, who had founded the department in 1902. And many of you who are associated with Marshall University will know him best for his bronze bust of John Marshall, which is located in front of Old Main on the college, on the university campus. Another uh, uh, etcher who uh, worked in our region and was associated with Huntington was uh, Clara Wiltsey. And this is her etching the Charleston waterfront circa 1940s. She was born in California and moved to Charleston, West Virginia, where she grew up. And she attended Marshall University and the University of Kentucky and Syracuse University. Um, she worked in Charleston at the Woodrow Wilson School and then at Marshall, where she served as an assistant professor of art. And after leaving Marshall, she went to first to Duluth, Minnesota to teach and then ended her career at Ball State University in Muncie, Indiana, retiring in 1971. And she's particularly known in West Virginia for this print work, including a series of etchings of, uh, of Charleston. One of the best illustrators to come out of Huntington was Charles Hawes. Hawes was the do son of a prominent doctor in Huntington. He was born here in 1909. And while he, he worked as an artist, he tried to make his living as a, um, as a guide in his state for hunting, fishing, and trapping, but he found he couldn't pay his bills. So he traveled to Chicago to study, to study at the Chicago, Chicago Academy of Fine Arts. He became nationally known for his illustration work, working for lots of major companies, such as Dodge Automobiles and Sinclair Oil, and also for a number of prominent publications, including Collier's Magazine, American Legion Magazine, the American Weekly, and Saturday Evening Post. And what we have here is actually on the right is a cover of American Weekly from the 19. 1953, and this shows a young man who's, who's getting ready for a date, he's getting himself dressed up, he's testing his ukuleles, bringing some pillows, he heads out and he goes to take a girl to the lake and she's only interested in fishing. So uh, a very fun cover illustration. Uh, but he spent a lot of decades living in St. Croix in the Virgin Islands and the image that left is one of his watercolors. And he spent a lot of time depicting uh, daily life on St. Croix and uh, the watercolor on the left is actually a work from the museum's collection. One of the saddest stories of, of an artist who came to Huntington is that of uh, Edith Lake Wilkinson, who was born in Wheeling, West Virginia, studied there in local schools and with her mother, who was a well-known artist, traveled to New York City to study at the Art Students League and eventually went to Provincetown, where she became one of the first people involved with BJO Nornfeld's new print process called the White Line Woodblock Print. And that hers are among the earliest dated uh, and known to exist from 1914. Uh, this painting is a view of Provincetown Hill in, in Provincetown from the 1920, from probably about 1920. And the sad story about Edith is she ended up being incarcerated in a number of insane asylums by a corrupt lawyer who was stealing money from her family trust. And she spent the last two decades of her life here in Huntington in the state hospital here, unable to do artwork. And, Reserve, her time was only reserved to do craft work, which was something they let many of the different um, uh, uh, you know, residents of the home do. But those of you who have been, who've maybe have seen the documentary on her on HBO, uh, you know, packed in a truck, trunk, the lost work of Edith Lake Wilkinson. And we were delighted to hold the first major uh, art museum exhibition of her work here several years ago. Now, one of the other big things that happened in Huntington 
that sort of spurred even more artists was the creation of the Huntington Museum of Art. This is a picture from the 1960s of school children lined up to come into the museum. Uh, and this next image here is an image of the uh, front desk and the, the front exhibition gallery. Opened in 1952, the museum became a place where many local artists would gather and exhibit. It's also where the Tri-State Arts Association really became involved in the early days of the museum and where uh, they did a lot of work with uh, the museum and its exhibition schedule. And a number of the local artists who sort of came out, you know, and appeared on the scene after this period that were, and that were featured in Huntington were people like Melvin Booth, whose work here, Freedom March from 1965 is in the museum collection. Uh, Booth was uh, raised in West Virginia. His father moved his family to the Huntington area uh, uh, where they um, owned a grocery store. And then when it came time for Booth to open his own business, he opened his own little store in Guyandot near Huntington. He was a sort of self-taught artist um, with no training. And he, what he would do is he would paint in between customers when they came into his store. And uh, he was discovered by the museum and had a solo exhibition here in the 1960s. And it's going to create about 300 paintings based on his early memories of growing up in, in West Virginia. Um, uh, this is another uh, local painter. This is a painting by uh, Steve Wheeler. Uh, Wheeler was raised in uh, Columbus, Ohio, attended Ohio State University and worked as an engineer coming to Huntington, uh, where he uh, worked uh, in his private time as an artist. And in fact, we used to offer his artwork for sale in the museum store here uh, in Huntington. And the picture at right that you see is a picture of him and his second wife, Sarah Slack Wheeler, who was also an artist. And after their deaths, the, uh, Sarah left a trust to support the acquisition of artwork for the museum, which is one of the big ways we're able to bring more art into the collection here in Huntington. Uh, the work that's depicted here, which is in the collection, is uh, an Italian view uh, done from uh, the Wheeler's travels overseas. Uh, this is a great work. Uh, it's one of my favorites in the collection by our local artists. This is by Mildred Loiterman, and it's called The Wise One, and it's a watercolor and ink. You can see all the delicate uh, shapes that go into creating this work. Uh, she was born in Logan, West Virginia, attended the Trapagan School of Fashion, uh, and was a longtime member of the Tri-State Arts Association uh, and the Allied Artists of West Virginia. And her claim to fame locally is that she created the drawing of the Marshall Monument uh, which was located in Spring Hill Cemetery that was featured on the cover of the 1970 Memorial Tributes Program that honored those killed in the infamous November 1970 Marshall University plane crash. Uh, and we're very happy to have this work, the wise one in the museum collection. Um, another local artist uh, was Carolyn Newcomb, born in Huntington. She studied at Marshall University and at the Booth Bay Studios in Maine at Miami University in Ohio and the Massachusetts School of Art. Uh, in Maine, she studied with the painters Frank Allen Booth and Roger Deering. And at the Huntington Museum of Art, she studied under the painters Arnold Blanche and Fletcher Martin, who both taught as part of the museum studio program. And she was a popular uh, art teacher in the public schools here in, in the Huntington area, including at the Monroe School and later at Kemmack Junior High School uh, for almost 20 years. And this is a work called Spring, which is in the museum's collection. Uh, before the museum had its master artist program, we used to bring artists here uh, for extended uh, uh, stays to teach at the museum uh, for you know two, three year uh, periods. And um, this is one of those artists, Fred Gross, he was born in Buffalo, New York, attended Syracuse University and the New School for Social Research. Uh, he later became a photographer with the Army and also studied at the Chinoard Art Institute located in Los Angeles, California. He was the artist in residence at the museum from 1969 to 1971 and is known for the large stained glass window he designed that's housed in our art library here. And following his time in Huntington, he uh, worked at Drake University in Des Moines, Iowa. And this work is an untitled uh, watercolor in the museum's collection. Another one of these artists in residence uh, who was here in the 70s was Klaus Illenfeld. Uh, Illenfeld is a sculptor who was born in Germany, studied there uh, under the noted sculptor Hans Ullmann before coming to the United States in 1957. He lived and worked in Durham, North Carolina, uh, where he was introduced to the famous Bauhaus architect Harry Bitoyo, with whom he also studied, and of course, who was associated with Marshall University 
uh, as he created the memorial fountain there. And uh, Illenfeld's been an artist in residence across the country at a number of places and uh, currently resides in Pennsylvania. And this is his bronze sculpture entitled Venus from 1970. Uh, one of the more interesting artists that came out of our area is, uh, is uh, Ron Fowler, who's pictured here in the center. Uh, Ron was born in Kentucky, attended Marshall University. He studied at Marshall and then in Washington, DC, where he studied ballet. Uh, in 1972, he began work as the director of the Children's Television Theater Workshop, and in the 1980s, uh, moved to Provincetown, Massachusetts, where he was known for this true dichotomy of art. On the left, he was known for doing the Provincetown Carnival posters, the big LGBTQ event that occurs every year in Provincetown. And then on the right, he was also known for his beautiful Impressionist paintings of uh, Cape Cod. Uh, uh, he was such a great uh, figure drawing artist that in 1992, he, uh, he was selected to be one of the illustrators of the book, The New Joy of Gay Sex. So uh, really an interesting artist to come out of our region and uh, be associated with Huntington. Uh, this abstract work entitled Paris uh, is by Dan uh, Moore. He was born in Huntington and studied, began studying art at the age of nine with Marion Vest Fors, who we've talked about earlier. He later attended Washington and Lee University where he received his degree in the history of fine art. He then traveled to New York City where he attended, attended the Art Students League, uh, where he studied with the noted painters Ivan Olinsky and Robert Philippe. He also studied with uh, Robert Beverly Hale and the German expatriate artist George Groths at the Skowhegan School of Painting and Sculpture. And then he was hired there to actually teach fresco at the school after he finished his studies. He later returned to Huntington where he became a, a well-known builder in our area. Uh, here's a work that I uh, really uh, love from our collection entitled Fractured Squares. It's by George Snyder, a well, really well-known sculptor to come out of our area. He was born in Charleston and attended Marshall University where he got his BA in 1973. He then attended the University of North Carolina uh, where he also taught. And he's particularly known for his tubular and cylindrical sculptures that are offered in finish in bright colors. And they've been, they've been exhibited and are held in collections all over the United States. And uh, this work here is a play on that. It's actually a painting of these uh, tubular uh, structures, which are brightly colored. Uh, and it's, it's a very large painting in our collection. And uh, I'm really delighted we have this. Another artist who, who's really become very well known is Joseph Hughes. This is his painting, Dark Field. He was born in Moundsville, West Virginia and attended Marshall University. Uh, that same year in 1964, when he graduated, he traveled to Europe where he studied at the University of London and then came back to study at the University of Cincinnati and then back to Marshall University where he got his MA. After that, he moved to California and became an extraordinarily successful a painter who's exhibited all over the United States and internationally. And according to the dealer, George Lawson, uh, Hughes has resolved perhaps better than anyone else working today, the dauntingly complex relationship between the immaterial aura of color and the physical support that generates the color image. And uh, we're very happy to have a number of small works by uh, Hughes in our collection here uh, in Huntington. Uh, the final uh, work I really want to talk about today before I go to, to talk about two interesting discoveries as part of this book project is this work, Double Exposure, by Connie McClure. McClure was born in Huntington and attended the College of Mount St. Joseph in Cincinnati and later the University of Cincinnati. She also studied at a number of other institutions including the University of Alabama, uh, the Ringling School of Art in Florida, Marshall University, the Skowhegan School of Painting and Sculpture, uh, and at the Fresco Workshop that was held at Castle Hill in Truro, Massachusetts. Um, she, twice she was a visiting artist at the American Academy in Rome and is known as the longtime instructor at the Art Academy of Cincinnati. Uh, but this is a wonderful work and what it is, it's based on a photograph her, her father took of her and her mother when she was a child and it was a photo that was taken on a piece of film that had already been used a couple of times. So what you have is an image of her as a child being held by her mother laid over two scenes, one of an, uh, of an alley in, in Huntington and also of sort of a rural street scene in Farmstead. Uh, really wonderful work that we were given by Connie not long before her death, which occurred in 2020. Now, two of the very interesting stories that came out of the uh, work done in this book was the discovery that we had uh, this artist and noted thief that came to Huntington. 
uh, John uh, L. Holmes, known as John Lieber in Huntington, uh, was a skilled engraver, uh, but was also had many aliases because he was a jewel thief. And in 1936, he stole $20,000 worth of jewelry in Clarksburg, West Virginia. He escaped arrest. He was later arrested in Texas in 1939 and imprisoned. He then escaped again, <clears throat> was recaptured in Atlanta, Georgia for embezzlement and larceny uh, before being released in 1950. He then moved to Huntington, where he was hired by the Standard Printing Company to work as an engraver and illustrator. He met and married a local woman, Gertrude Kilpatrick, who owned a jewelry store in town, and I bet you can see what's coming. After marrying her and gaining control of the store, he stole $50,000 worth of cash and jewelry and disappeared from Huntington, never to be seen again. Uh, he was last mentioned in an FBI bulletin in the late 50s um, and depicted here as an article from uh, one of the local papers about um, um, <laughs> the search for him. Uh, it doesn't seem that he was ever caught. And our research indicates that he may have actually died in 1970 out west. Uh, probably never having paid for his crimes. Uh, the other fun story is the one that comes uh, out of uh, this bio. Uh, this is uh, on the left, a work by uh, Helen Thompson, April 9, 1959, which was actually showed here at the museum at that time. She was born in Pittsburgh and studied under Joseph Fitzpatrick, the well-known Allegheny uh, artist. Uh, she attended the University of Pittsburgh where she studied with Arnold Blanche and at the Art Students League uh, where she studied in uh, during their summer program in Woodstock. She moved with her husband, Sydney to Huntington after World War II, where she studied art at the Huntington Museum of Art. And following her divorce in 1970, she wrote her first book, which you see pictured at far right, The Sensuous Divorcee, uh, which became a runaway bestseller uh, in America. And the funny thing about it is uh, she wrote uh, in the dedication of the book, uh, that it, the book was dedicated to her ex-husband, Sidney, with whom I could never have written this book, which was all about sex and dating after marriage. So I wanna thank everybody for joining me this evening and uh, enjoying this presentation. I hope you'll come to see the exhibit at the museum, which is up until mid-January, 2022. And I hope you'll think about purchasing the book. Um, if you do have um, uh, or know of an artist who did live in Huntington, uh, during their career and they're not in the book. We'd love to know about them. As I said earlier, we've created a page on the website and uh, we're going to be constantly updating that uh, so that we can um, uh, learn more and more about the artists who've worked in Huntington. And again, thank you for joining us today. Bye-bye.